Jill. How are you doing today, Jill? I'm rocking and rolling, baby. How are you? I'm pretty damn good. Pretty damn good myself. I want to welcome everybody to Jack and Jill, the art and culture tell-all. And for those of you who haven't seen us before, I want to let you know what we're all about. But before I do, I want you to follow us on YouTube, if you haven't already, at Jack and Jill Arts and Culture. You'll see all of our shows there. They're very informative. Our guest today is Juliana Ferrero. She is the consultant curator for the city of Pompano Beach, Florida. And I have been in several of her exhibitions. She is an incredible curator. And on that note, let's bring her in. Hi, Juliana. Hi. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, you for joining us. And this is Jackie Rosen, my partner. In nice Coffee. to meet you, Jackie. This is a great program you guys are doing. Thanks. Thank you. There's, there's my art. Wonderful. And thank you. And then there's Jill. And yes. Very I'm familiar with Jill. Yeah, very similar people, but it's interesting how different everybody is when they express mm -hmm. themselves. Right. But, um, I'm glad you're here with us. Thank you so much. You're big doings, and we're happy to have you. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you a question as a curator. Um, I was a curator for many, many years, but I want to ask you during this time, you know, now we used to just meet artists. We would both meet artists in person. We would develop mm -hmm. relationships. So what advice can you give artists during this time and how they can speak and engage with museum professionals to create a connection and have their art seen? Yes, well, that's, that's the question right now of the million because as you look at the programming and what's happening, not only for artists, but for arts institutions, uh, there's a, there are a lot of organizations that are right now are facing closures. And so even the programming um, for galleries and museums is being affected by the current situation with COVID-19. Uh, so like you mentioned, I mean, uh, it's very important to build relationships. So I think that the, and I always tell this to artists, I mean, the first thing that they need to do is start with some research. And right now it starts with looking at which galleries and organizations are still open. Uh, look at arts organizations that are promoting artists. I know I've seen many that are doing auctions, that are um, doing call to artists. So do research, see which galleries are open, uh, which ones are promoting artists as, um, as they are. Um, I work as a consulting curator for the city of Pompano Beach. Mm -hmm. So our current situation as of today, the galleries are closed but we continue with the programming in terms of exhibitions. So we switch to a virtual platform. So we are doing the artist talks are now online instead of in person. Um, in, um, we are having virtual tours with me very short, like three minutes so that people are engaged. Great. Great. And so I think that artists need to start looking at which organizations are active. Look at the type of artwork that they're exhibiting. Look at the call to artists and read the, 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 the statement. I mean, oftentimes I've seen artwork that comes into call to artists and they may be way over topic. So the chances of there are being selected, um, it's, it's reduced. Yeah. So spend some time. That they just lost that uh, entry fee big time. Exactly. And that's an investment, you know? So it's key what you said about look where you can start a relationship because once that bond is created, it, it's long term and it opens the doors to further opportunities because curators, I mean, with your past experience, wow. I'm sure that sometimes you recommended artists in your network to other curator that was doing another topic. So the key word, like you said, is relationship. Okay, so my question, just to, to follow up for a second. Mm -hmm. So those are great ideas in which to, what we can do in this strange time to kind of keep on top of our game and continue to work our, our art business. Mm -hmm. um, but say somebody wanted to contact you. They thought they were the greatest painter on the planet Earth, whatever. They wanted to contact you and see if there were any, you know, or any other museum professional or any other. How do you do it now other than the call to artists? 
because how would somebody be able to establish a relationship with you? It's interesting that you mentioned in part of the research, uh, many galleries, including the three venues at Pompano Beach, they re received ongoing submissions. So this is not a call for entries. Uh, guest curators, uh, any artists can research. And I know, I think that Frank also has an open submission. So follow the um, steps. So in, in Pompano Beach specifically, people submit the portfolio and the instructions are on the website. And um, they're, they're received. And uh, they get to me. I specifically don't receive it, but ev everything that the city of Pompano Beach re uh, receives in terms of portfolios, they come to me. And then as I'm building exhibitions, I may pull from those submissions. Uh, one case, one successful case uh, that came that way was Lori Arbel. She was not on my radar. And uh, she just had her solo at the cultural center. We just took it down a few months ago. She did her research. He, she submitted the portfolio that way, and she got into my radar. Um, yeah. So we, like, we love our we love her. She's we a love good our girl. Lori. You know, don't you love talking and have people taking notes? I love that. Yes. <laughs> I think that it's no. terrific, Jill. I know you have a question, hon. Well, actually, I wanted to go back in a little bit in time. Juliana and I first met actually at the Frank at a meetup that the Frank had a, a few years that. back. And what was interesting about that meeting was I then turned that meeting into um, a question. I called her at, at the Bailey Contemporary Arts and I said to her, you know, I've been on the website and I'd like to send a proposal, but I have a question for you in terms of um, whatever it was at that time that I had about the actual proposal. And I think that a lot of artists don't realize that they can reach out to curators and ask them questions. It's okay to ask questions, That's especially great, if you're going to submit a proposal based on what's the, the guidelines that are in the actual um, site on the website, which is which so there is, are on that yeah. website for Bailey. There are proposal. Uh, this is how you do. Yeah, like there's very specific guidelines that you can follow. But if there is a question that you have, well, now would be the good time to reach out by email instead of a phone call. So if you, artists must know that if you want to send a proposal to any gallery, besides finding out if the gallery has closed, um, mm -hmm. really look at the guidelines carefully and understand, first of all, do I fit into Bailey Contemporary Arts? What am I looking for? What, what kind of exhibitions do they have? Do your homework. We talk about this all the time, we, Juliana and I, about, about the, the effort that artists have to put into the business side, which is how do you fit in? Where do you fit in? And if you don't fit in, then don't submit. Yeah. It, then find somewhere else where you do fit because you will fit. You'll find your place. But don't, don't feel like you can't ask questions. So through our relationship that we have built over the, the years, Juliana now knows my work so well that she has come to me and said, oh, Jill, you know, there's an exhibition that I have in mind for you. And it was with the, the, um, the poetry, the poetry and the art um, exhibition, which I was honored to be in. It was extraordinary. I actually have one of the paintings behind me over here was in that exhibition. And that's how special it is to build a relationship. And, I'm, and I know that we're in a different time right now and it's really difficult to build relationships. But even if you communicate through email, um, Juliana, can you cover that? Um, something else that we wanted to ask is, what's the most important thing um, in relationship to what we're discussing about websites, what what should artists have on their website? What what are you looking for when you look at a website or even an Instagram page? Perfect. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I mean, in terms of website and Instagram, uh, have it very organized. I usually, when someone reaches out to me, I and they send me their website, I want to look at what their statement is. Uh, they may know what they're doing, but I don't know. I don't know what they're trying to say with their artwork. So have a statement, have a bio or a resume. Both of them work. I want to know where you've been. I want to know what's of your interest. Um, have your bodies of work, have your series clearly labeled and organized. Make it a trip for me. I love to look at art. I love to spend time on websites. But if the website is not giving me anything, 
I just have to click. It, it takes my time away. In terms of Instagram, I found out, especially now with COVID, people are sharing more of what they're doing on the daily, daily life. But keep the separate account for your art and your personal life. Um, recently, I asked someone, can you see, I'm organizing I'm at the latest stages of selecting the work. And because I kind of go to artist studios right now, I'm looking at their website and their Instagrams. And um, they told me it's in my Instagram. And as I was looking for this exhibition, it's about abstraction, lines, very constructive art. I was digging through barbecue photos of their families. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so um, right. it, it, it was painful for me. It was because painful. This is, this is not a business. This should be a business site. Correct, correct. And, so, and, this, and, and the interesting thing is that I'm talking about established artists. So they, they, they don't think they have the issue, but um, I was having a difficulty uh, going through uh, their Instagram. So Instagram in itself is not really a portfolio. I cannot see the things organized as a series, yes. but I do follow a lot of Instagrams. Quietly, I may follow someone for a year, sometimes two years, see what their process what is about. about. Yeah. Exactly. And then I may mean, reach out and it has happened uh, with a couple of exhibitions in, in Pompano Beach that I reached out to artists that they didn't know of existed. And I said, I love your work. I love what you've been doing. And it fits perfectly with these other exhibitions. Oh my gosh. So, they must have loved that reaching out. That's yes. Cool. Yes. I love seeing the post on Facebook. <laughs> Juliana, that's an exciting day for an artist. That's, that must be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Uh, for me too, you know, um, it's great when an artist opens up and the, the trust, because and I always tell artists thank you for the trust because in this relationship they're giving me their babies in a way you know you guys put so much work and so much time into each of your artworks and for me it's important to respect that and make sure that when we're installing the lighting is property that we're taking the care when we handle these artworks so uh, it's, it's, it's a thrill for me when an artist says yes as well that's my secret Yes, well, I, I can tell you well, from my own personal lover. experience with you that my work has been treated with the utmost of kindness. <laughs> when, I, when it's returned to me, there isn't anything. Oh. It's just perfect. Because we I'm, all have dings and, yeah. Right, it happens. I even dig my own art. But with, with, when I know I'm, I'm going into a show with you, it's it, the beautiful exposure that I get. The, you, you send out um, so much on social media about the exhibition. And the exhibition that I'm in right now, the space between us, um, it's unfortunate, but you know we might not be able to have a reception. But that's okay. You know, we we're still we're still out there. You're still trying. That's the most important thing. And exactly. People are we're watching. Trying. They are. They do look forward to exhibitions online. I know I do. Is that Juliana speak about how uh, most of the time you're booked at least two years in advance, eighteen months to to twenty four months in advance. But having said that sometimes you can still fit an artist in to one of the shows that are already booked. So, so artists shouldn't lose hope. They should still send in a proposal. Yes. Yes, that, that's key. And the thing is that with COVID, we had to reschedule. Um, I really wanted to give a chance to the exhibitions that just right open in, in March. So we're now in, in, in the city of Pompano, and we're looking at 36 months ahead. Uh -huh. But like you said, I mean, I'm always reviewing um, exhibitions so my advice to artists is have a proposal always handy. Have a portfolio. In marketing, people talk about your elevator speech. Have a PDF with uh, the following. I did some tips that I have on my screen. Oh, good. We wanted have to a PDF with your name clearly. How to contact you. Phone, website, Instagram, how I can look at you. That could be the cover. Include your artist statement. I want to know what you are about. Have a short bio, not three pages. Let me know who you are, where you study. I want to know that. Don't have more than 20 images and have those images with the um, technical information, title, medium, sizes. Sizes is very important. Size, very, size is important. Size <laughs> is major. If in the portfolio you can have a picture of an exhibition because we need to see also how it looks in terms of um, sizes, talking about sizes. Sometimes I cannot picture 20 by 20, but if yeah. I see it, how we look on an exhibition, 
put an installation shot. If you are sending, if you want to make those 20 images, maybe three different series, give me a statement for each of the series. Very short. And maybe four or five images of, of those. And have it on your email. Because when people, let's say, I love going to openings. I love when people come to my openings, like once this COVID situation allows us to go back to some sort of normality. I love people uh, meeting people at their openings and they we exchange cards and I say, send me your portfolio. And sometimes I wait months and sometimes I never hear from these people until they come back again. So have it on your outbox, on your draft, really ready. Even uh, at situations, sometimes tell me, look at my, they pull out the phone, look at my images. Why don't you show me your PDF? PDF opens in phones. This is my series. That's a tip that I think that it will make it more welcoming because we get a lot of people that pulls us and then they show us a hundred photos on Instagram. I may not have the retentive yeah. in my eyes to look at all that, yes, but yes. if you show me a portfolio on an iPad, on a phone, I'm hooked. It. For instance, like um, this is part of my pandemic series, right? And yes. Like, okay. I'm so bright and happy. I'm like, well, I'm damn bright and happy. However, there are like, <laughs> yes. we've talked about this before. There are like squares and ladders in here, and each rectangle or circle has a little way out. So it's up to you during mm -hmm. this pandemic. Are you going to be afraid? Or are you going to branch out and try to take this and make the best of a bad situation? These okay. ladders are, get me the out <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like enough already. I need to get out. But <laughs> there is a way out. So somebody looking at this, the reason I'm bringing this up, and not knowing that and just seeing an abstract painting wouldn't be able to relate or understand that there is meaning behind the work. Which is why your story is so important. And, and Juliana, another question about series. Can you explain as a curator, why is it important for an artist to have a series? Um, let's see. I mean, I don't think particular that it's important to have a series, but as an artist grow and as interest and thematics change, it's okay to cut and say, I'm trying something new. Mm -hmm. So someone can work on the same thematic and never diverge from that. And I think that's okay if they keep it interesting. But when someone starts with a new technique or someone that does textiles goes into photography well it's a different thing so tell me why tell me why you're doing photography because I believe I mean artists are not married to specific medium mm -hmm. I, I love when I see people doing photography people doing textile I'm, I'm open to that I love when an idea and a thematic carries on and sometimes I series could be the same thematic with different media so it's just grouping um your thoughts and your feelings in a way. So right. that's, that's kind of like my thoughts on that. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what we wanted to hear because, um, you know, jo like Jackie and I, we end up doing series. We love doing series. And when I did my series for Time Machine, which is this, wait, is that? Yeah, it's this painting behind me. Um, mm -hmm. When I came up with that, now all of a sudden I started doing mixed media, which I really don't do mixed media, but I decided I wanted to give it a shot and see where did I, where would, what direction was it going to take me in? So I was taking my old work, and I was saying from the 20th century, because it is, and, and then combining it with my work from the 21st century. And so when I felt that I was doing it well, I, I was very excited about it, and I wanted to keep continuing to create more and more paintings within the series. And it's, it's so Jackie is also exploring with her. She really does do mixed media as well, Jackie, because you use different types of um, you use like house paint, you use charcoal, you know, you're using oil, you're, just, you know, you're going in all, all kinds of different directions. And I'll use oil pastels sometimes, charcoal, depending on, you know, where I want to go in that particular piece. But, but working on something new is so exciting as, you know. Uh, yes. And it's funny that you mentioned about. that today, because today I decided that I have some pieces that I want to like repurpose. They're great pieces, mm -hmm. but also great backgrounds. The more I look at them, they need to say more. So what am I going to do? I'm going to use words. I'm going to use Hebrew letters. I'm also going to use 
you know, the English language. And I'm going to say what I have. I have a lot to freaking say. <laughs> here, okay? You're and so it's, shy. Come on. What are you talking about? Yeah, and it's going to be a reflection of the times because art, good art, should be a reflection of, of the times in which we live. Absolutely. So there's a lot to say because 2020, I wish it would be over. 2020 is like a little bit rough for me, and I'm sure it's rough for all of us. So there's a lot to say, and so now's my opportunity to say and express the way I'm feeling, not just by creating art, but by actually creating art, fine art, not commercial art, but yet still saying something so that someone can get it immediately. Um, another, uh, something else um, that we wanted to go over with you was, um, you know, artists do have trouble with their artist statements and their bios. How can an artist help themselves? Is it something as simple as just looking it up or should they seek guidance, mentors? What, what do you think artists should do? Uh, that's, that's actually a, a hard thing for someone to, to write the artist statement. Sometimes the serious statements come easier than the artist statement. The artist statement is really, why do I do what I do? But right. sometimes we have to, what I usually do as an exercise is looking at, see what people perceive from it. So get your, the people close to you and ask them, what do you see from this piece? From, and don't tell them anything about it and gather those thoughts. And then correcting them will help you or, or telling them if they're okay, if they nail it. Uh, will help you really decide, define, that's the word, define what you're really trying to say. Because I know that as an artist, you sometimes create and you bypass the brain. It goes straight from the heart, you're putting it out and you don't know why you're doing it, but it's talking to you. So I think that using the people close to you could be a first step. I know that there are a lot of career coaches that if you're really hitting um, you know, the wall, there, there's resources that you can use. And with bios, have different versions of it because sometimes um, in, I like to do portfolios, folders. So when people come to the exhibitions, they can see who it is. So I like to yeah. put longer versions right. of it. But if for marketing, sometimes I need something that is 50 words. Yeah. So have different versions of your bio also ready. Um, that's kind of like the business of it but there, there's help there's people that help out uh in terms of grants for instance i've sat in many panels and now my eyes i'm not a grants writer i could not write but i can catch the mistakes i can catch even in yeah. budgets i was like well this is not looking good so there's people that are trained to guide artists into fine-tuning their statements okay sure. um, i just um like for instance with my work it's all about mathematics no one would ever look at my work and say, oh, that's mathematics? No. <laughs> the last thing they would think. But the reason behind why it's mathematics is really interesting. It's about adding, subtracting, and multiplying like I do in my personal life and how I stay sane and all of that. So coming up with your why theme I think is incredibly important. And like you said, there are things. There's so many free resources out there. If you put... Just type into Google how an artist comes up with their why theme and just read and read and read and read. Yeah. They'll realize it takes time. It took me a year to figure out why I did what I did because it was very intuitive, like Jill. But like Jill's got it spot on as to her why, and it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> and I see the artist statements, like if we look in the nonprofit world, it's like the mission. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change that much. Your right. statement can change in your series. This time I'm, I'm exploring this thematic, this time I'm exploring this, but it's kind of like your compass. When once you narrow down and you're sure that your artist statement is what you are. I mean, of course it can change in time, but the more true and the more simplistic it is in a way, like the mission of a nonprofit, it could be just you know, a few sentences. This is what I am about. And this is what my art is about. Terrific. Okay, how about pricing, and especially in, in uh, Bailey Contemporary Arts? How does an artist go about pricing their work? That is very interesting. I mean, it, it does depend with the level of a person. I mean, because Bailey and the other venues uh, from the city of Pompano Beach are from a city, mm -hmm. we are not tied in making the sale. We don't have like a commercial gallery 
the need to make the sale. So mm -hmm. it allows us to show art that may not sell. You know what I mean? Like something to um, expose uh, the people to, um, from the community to, to see the artwork. Um, so it, 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 it varies, you know, we don't, we don't tell people how to price, um, the sale. We really, it part of the research that we were talking about earlier. There's a lot of different formulas depending on where our artist is. So um, that's what it is. And take into consideration also the commissions like galleries and, and some organizations also keep between, I've seen up to 70%. At right. Billy Contemporary Arts is thirty percent, so right. keep keep that in mind. Right. You know um, what I've done is I've researched people that have the same amount of experience that I do, have a similar background, a similar look. Not exactly, obviously, but um, in the area, in the same geographic location, and so forth. And that's how I came up with my prices. And then I spoke to some curators, uh, some directors, some gallery owners, and so forth, and. You know, that's the way I'm doing it. Jill, how about you? How are you doing it? How are you doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> I'm doing, I, I price the same way. You know, I take in, but I also take into account materials, time, time spent. Um, because, you know, the materials are everything. We, ha we have to uh, have a budget for our art supplies. Yeah. And if you paint on canvas, depending on the canvas that you paint on, it can become a very expensive proposition. Yeah, it depends so, on your substrate. Yeah, for sure. Right. So you have to take all that into account, but you also have to know the venue that you're selling in and you cannot outprice yourself or underprice yourself. So you really have to do your homework once again on how much are the paintings selling for at that particular place, be it, you know, Bailey Contemporary Arts because it's city owned, or is it a gallery that's interested in representing you and most galleries take 50%. And you also have to understand that before you call or speak to or email someone, um, what, what what type of a place is this? Because if you if they already if let's say you send something to Juliana and she realized that you didn't know that this was a city owned gallery, that's not going to um, it, that's not going to help you in the sense that um, it's, she's going to know you didn't do your homework. And it's always always important to to do that because. Every curator, no matter who they are, they will favor the artists that are, have done their research. And they Much know more who feeling. you are and what you're all about. Yes. You know, in, in that vein, um, I keep my, no matter what the commission is, no matter where I'm showing, it is consistent across the board. Right. I will not change because I'm at a penthouse in Williams Island. Then I'm at, uh, you know, ArtServe, like that's where my studio is in Fort Lauderdale. It's the same across the board. So when pricing your art, you take that into consideration. You use 50% as the most, because that's the most I'd ever give, um, as your marker. And that's the way I do it. I think, don't you think that's important? You consistently have the that's That's key. That's key. And the thing is that with some art galleries uh, south in Miami, for instance, when there's time for Miami Arts Week, during our Basel, I see that there's also an overhead that will charge you for the wall. Right. And so wall when artists are pricing- $5,000, you get one piece. Exactly. So then are you, are you selling or are you pricing more to put it on your resume? So there are the things to uh, keep in mind. It's not a bad thing to do, but keep, keep things in mind. I mean, there's an easy formula for people that are starting just to give them an idea. Um, I, I've seen that people price one dollar per square inch and based on that if the number is too high then you adjust if it's too low then you okay, adjust but at least it gives percent. you a number okay. so i i heard it once okay, one dollar square foot and okay, so 36 <laughs> by 36 is what <laughs> okay you guys keep talking i'm doing this like I work oh, now i want to know 36, okay, the faces, 36, the 36 equals 1,296. So maybe for I'm someone- I'm right on there. I'm at like 1950. Because of course- So it's on. not that off. So make sure oh. that it covers your time. It covers That's the materials. Exactly. If, if it doesn't do, at least it gives you a number. And then from oh, that, you good. can say good, bad. I like that. I good. never knew that. That's a good That's, one. That works for me. To, uh, to, to solve that issue. It's all- <laughs> When you're buying a house, too, like that you think about the square footage. Yes. 
rates. Exactly. You don't want to overpay. No. You and don't. art can be a big investment. But art, especially during this time, is such a happy thing to buy. And I know that art is selling now because of COVID. It is. Any it's idea not. how? I've seen a beautiful hashtag. I don't know the hashtag per se, but it's a oh, movement when so artists, I'll give it to you and you can put it right now as we speak. I'll, I'll give it to you guys. But it's a, artists are selling artwork by no more than $200. So obviously select the pieces. But the commitment is that once the artists reach up five uh, pieces, um, $1,000, they, they will buy artwork from another artist that is I love participating. This. Yes. So it's like artists supporting artists, and there's this. a lot of people buying. I there's a lot of, of people buying. Too. Not because mm -hmm. I thought of it, but because I read about it. But I'm an art buyer. I love to support other I artists. love I that love initiative. I love it. And it goes straight better. to the artist. It doesn't go through any other organization. So I'll... the Hashtag will be, I guess, is playing right now. <laughs> but right. I love that initiative. Yeah, I think that's a great initiative. I'd love to buy other people's art. Of course, not Jill's, but you know, <laughs> anybody else. Um, no, I love Jill. <laughs> but that's cool, isn't it? Yeah. You're reinvesting and you're moving your stuff around and it feels really good, especially it does. now. Well, always. It's always a good thing. I like it. Well, Juliana... I cannot thank you enough for coming on today as our special guest. You are amazing. I, yeah. I adore you. <laughs> I love how our relationship has evolved over the years. She talks about and you, yes. I talk about you to, to Jackie all the time. And I am just thrilled that you came on today. You gave out so much incredible information. Really good stuff. We're going to help so many artists understand the relationship between themselves and a curator and what they have to do and what are the most important steps. So today was an awesome day. Thank winner, you. Winner, winner, babe. Awesome. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's important to have these conversations so people don't see us as curators, as these people in this cloud that we can be talked to. We can. We love to talk and we love to see yeah. art. So we, thank you so much for the opportunity. Phenomenal. Okay, just to just to finish up, yes, thank you very much. But in the next 17 minutes, you'll re be receiving such a shitload of stuff from me. <laughs> Don't cut that out because those are the facts, Jack. Jack. But you're going to be overwhelmed and excited and I appreciate everything you said. Like I have like all these... <laughs> Thank you, Juliana. Notes of every guest. That comes. You're welcome. Mwah. Thank you. Mwah to thank you, you. Too. Okay, thank you. Hi, ladies. Wait, before we go, can you come back for another? Oh episode? yeah. Would you come back and be on our show again? Are we? You talking to me? Yes. No, she's talking to me. I, I was I'm leaving. I thought back. that it was in before between I'm you two. Coming back, Juliana. Would you, would you come back? You are coming back, of course. <laughs> yeah. Our show. Okay, fantastic. We'll come up with like a different topic. Think it's about that. Different topic. Absolutely. Think about a different topic that you might like to talk about. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What's cool. trending? I don't know. Okay. I'll look. I'll look at things. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to be a, a guest again. This is this yeah, is like fun. What, most of it, we had a good time. Yeah, we had a great time. Too like, bad Jackie's so boring, though. <laughs> I, I know. I know. It's like, but you know, I have to be here because I have the name Jack. Okay. Right. We go together. It could just be the Jill show. It's nowhere near as cute. Which I love. I love Jack and Jill. He's great. Thank you. That was me. All me. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'll be back. Bye, okay. ladies. A pleasure. Well. <laughs>